And Professor Clements with you again as we uh, continue through magnetism, talking about the Hall effect, magnetic forces on uh, wires that are carrying current, torques on current loops, magnetic fields produced by currents, uh, interaction of two parallel wires carrying current, and mass spectrometer. So it's kind of a long list. We're going to hit the highlights here, starting with the Hall effect. I've claimed that the uh, conventional current is wrong, that it is not positive charge that's moving through a, uh, a wire, but instead the electrons. The Hall effect gives proof of this. So we have two drawings here, conventional current going off to the right, and in these drawings we can see uh, the correct view, the electrons traveling to the left opposite the direction of the conventional current. And then in the bottom view here we have a positive charge that's traveling off to the right in the direction of conventional current. We're in the presence of a magnetic field coming towards you out of the paper. As the charge would move in this situation, uh, it's going to respond to a magnetic force. So you should fire up your right hand, put your fingers in the direction of velocity, rotate your wrist so you can bend your fingers out of the computer screen towards you. Your thumb would be pointing up. Because it's a negative charge, the force goes down. So this prediction is it will pile up electrons towards this side of the uh, wire. With the right hand rule applied to the positive charge moving, your fingers go in the direction of the velocity. Your hand uh, is rotated, so you can easily bend your fingers up in the direction of the magnetic field. And your force uh, on the positive charge is towards the bottom. So this model would say that positive charges pile up on the edge of the wire, and uh, leaving us extra electrons at the uh, top of the wire and we can put a voltmeter across the wire and determine the polarity across the wire. When we do so, we find that this is the correct result. Um, we have a situation where the negatives pile up along the bottom of the wire. It proves that electrons are moving in the wire. So that's our uh, little Hall effect uh, discussion. Electrons are moving in a wire, not protons. Next we consider the force, magnetic force, on a wire that's carrying current in the presence of a magnetic field. We should not be surprised that there is a force because we have moving charges in the wire. And we know there's a force, magnetic force, on moving charges. So in this situation our conventional current's coming out towards you. If you would use your right hand and put your hand, your fingers of your right hand in that direction, and then rotate your palm so you can easily turn your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, these red arrows, you should find that your thumb is pointing upward, the direction of the force. There is a force on a wire that's carrying current, and we can calculate the value of that force with a, a formula, the current in the wire times the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field times the strength of the magnetic field, and we'll assume that strength is uniform, is constant, over the whole length of the wire, and then multiply by the sine of theta, where theta is the angle in between the current and the magnetic field. And you can see in this sketch, that would be 90 degrees. The current is coming out towards you. The magnetic field is off to your right. So that would be 90 degrees, and that's a fairly simple calculation. Um, then we can uh, consider torques on loops of current. So we have here a situation, a loop of wire in between two poles of a magnet. And if we consider any section of this uh, loop of wire over on the right side here, the current is going down. If you look carefully at the blue arrows, the current is going down. So I would put my fingers along that current direction. I would rotate my wrist so I could easily turn my fingers towards the south pole and I would find that my thumb is pointing out towards you. If I come to the other side, the current is in the reverse direction. The current is up on this side of the loop. And putting my fingers in the direction of the current, rotating my wrist so I can easily turn my uh, 
uh, my fingers in the direction of B, and I find that the force is back into the paper in that situation. Now, if you notice, both of these forces have a lever arm. They're some distance away from the axis of rotation, so we get a torque, and the magnetic force will create a, a torque in this situation that can be um, used to make a motor or can be used to make an amp meter as we've uh, used in class. This slide has a little bit more detail from the top view of calculating or specifying the direction of the force and again you can see the uh, the torque that exists there. You might want to pause my uh, video here and examine uh, try your right hand on this on these diagrams. Uh, in terms of a motor you possibly could appreciate that uh, we'd have a problem if this loop goes around too far with the current keeping the same direction. If the uh, loop goes around too far, the torque will actually reverse on this loop and the, uh, the coil would just kind of oscillate back and forth. So the solution for that is to change the direction of the current every 180 degrees of the loop of wire at the proper time the brushes here go across the gap and then connect to the other half that they uh, were connected to before. In that way, the torque maintains a constant direction and the loop maintains a constant direction of spin. And that's a, a, a useful motor where the uh, loop is not oscillating back and forth but maintains a constant direction. Here's an example of a meter. The uh, magnetic force creates a torque of a certain size. That can be counterbalanced with the torque of a spring, and then we get a reading on a scale. If we increase the current, that increases the force, increases the torque, and the needle will go up higher as we uh, uh, compress the spring a little bit more. And again, the wire carrying current uh, generates magnetic field that are circles around the wire. There's stronger magnetic field close to the wire, and magnetic field gets weaker further away. If there's more current, there are more charge carriers, and we have a stronger magnetic field. And we'll do calculations with that to uh, illustrate that. Um, if we have a loop of wire, coil of wire, now it's no longer straight, and we have an opportunity for magnetic field from different pieces of wire to add together at the center of the loop. And again, there's an equation that will tell us this magnetic field right at the center. So it's not the magnetic field near the wire, magnetic field at the center. And we'll be able to do some calculations that give us that uh, strength. And the calculation for the magnetic field is different for this loop of wire than for a straight wire. Again, because we have magnetic field components adding together from different pieces of the wire at the center of the loop. We can also create a solenoid device where we have a cylinder of wire and there's current in each loop and that will create a magnetic field inside this solenoid and it's fairly uniform. It's not completely uniform at the ends but it's uh, fairly uniform and that's a different formula that we'll practice with in class uh, to uh, give us the strength of the magnetic field and it's especially true value for magnetic field at the center of the solenoid. And then uh, if we have two conductors carrying current, do they repel or do they attract? Here's the uh, current shown for the two wires, both upward. If we consider the magnetic field created by wire one, if you put your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers would wrap around. So here at wire number two, the current is going into the computer screen and now do the right hand rule with the current and this magnetic field generated by wire number one. So your fingers up in the direction of the current, rotate your wrist so you can bend your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field that's into the paper and you find that there's a force to the left. If you'd repeat this exercise with uh, wire number two generating magnetic field at wire number one you'll find also there's a force of attraction towards the other wire. Two wires that carry current in the same direction will attract each other. If you would reverse one of these currents, 
you'll find that two wires that carry current in opposite direction repel each other. So two wires with current in the same direction, you should go through step by step with right hand rule. Current from wire number one creates a magnetic field into the paper here. The right hand rule of force on a wire that's carrying current gives us a force to the left, an attractive force. And then the mass spectrometer. If we, outside the mass spectrometer, have an electric field and a magnetic field that uh, are perpendicular to each other, we'll get the situation where for one particular velocity, the strength of the electric force, Q times E, will be equal to the strength of the magnetic force, QVB. These forces are in opposite direction. Consequently, there's no acceleration in this direction for the charged object. Then it will go straight into the mass spectrometer. This is called a velocity selector. There are many different velocities of ions coming through this velocity selector. Only the ions with the proper velocity will go straight through. Then once we're in this region, there's only magnetic field, no electric field off to the right. And again, the magnetic force is creating centripetal force. QVB equals MV squared over R. And we can calculate the radius. This radius will be different for different mass particles. Though it's a mass spectrometer, the different masses land at a different point, make an impact at a different point. Something a little tricky here is that the uh, QVB equals MV squared over R. That's R is a radius. Once you calculate R, you need to double that so you get diameter on this semicircle. So keep reading and practicing.